One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, by me. You gotta wonder, have Sargon and Black Pigeon Speaks decided they could get away with hijacking my content because no one knows my tiny channel exists? So it's a pretty safe bet that the left-leaning anti-Tolkien articles are written in earnest. Did you know that Lord of the Rings is racist? That's what The Guardian thought in 2002. Or if they are, in fact, insincere clickbait hyperbole with the cynical ulterior motive of page views and ad revenue. And I do find it interesting how clickbait journalism at tabloid outlets like BuzzFeed, The Huffington Post, Vox, and The Guardian are so willfully ignorant and disingenuous all for the sake of getting more clicks on their site. I probably like orc posting a little more than is good for me. Just, just look at it. It's fucking glorious. Naturally, the memes that came from this were amazing. I myself really liked the orc posting meme. So that leaves the diehard feminist and progressive types who can't stand Tolkien and what it is they believe he stands for. I am sure that your intuitions of the politics of this are totally legitimate. And it's not you projecting your dumbass progressive politics onto it. The York posting, though, without making more out of it than is necessary, hopefully, says very little about what Tolkien the man and author intended to express. Its satirical crosshairs remain steadily hovering over the reality of foolish open borders policy in the real world. Orc posting began trending on Twitter and then over on the containment board that is 4chan poll, as well as satirizing globalism. The right is using the Lord of the Rings, goblins, and especially orcs to mock their crusade, or jihad rather, of social justice and open borders. Tolkien and his allegedly romantic convictions are, as the saying goes, on the wrong side of history. It would appear that Middle Earth is on the wrong side of history. But I'll deal with them and that petty YouTube drama later. Right now we're going to dive into a very telling passage from The Lord of the Rings that sheds a lot of light on Tolkien's view of race, especially the races of the enemies of Gondor and Rohan, and all the other peaceful people of Middle-earth. This takes place immediately after Faramir and his men capture Frodo and Sam and Athelion. Sam, eager to see more, went now and joined the guards. He scrambled a little way up into one of the larger of the bay trees. For a moment he caught a glimpse of swarthy men in red, running down the slope some way off, with green-clad warriors leaping after them, hewing them down as they fled. Arrows were thick in the air. Then suddenly, straight over the rim of their sheltering bank, a man fell, crashing through the slender trees nearly on top of them. He came to rest in the fern a few feet away, face downward, green arrow feathers sticking from his neck below a golden collar. His scarlet robes were tattered, his corslet of overlapping brazen plates was rent and hewn, his black plaits of hair braided with gold were drenched with blood, his brown hand still clutched the hilt of a broken sword. It was Sam's first view of a battle of men against men, and he did not like it much. He was glad that he could not see the dead face. He wondered what the man's name was and where he came from, and if he was really evil at heart or what lies or threats had led him on the long march from his home, and if he would not really rather have stayed there in peace. What more do you need to know about Tolkien not being a racist in the derogatory sense progressives normally intend that word? 
You have to be especially ignorant and committed to that ignorance to continue to assert that Tolkien was full of hatred for those of other races after reading or hearing that scene. But of course, progressives often argue that race is nothing more than a social construct and a biologically meaningless term, and therefore its mere usage must indicate that you are full of hate for, for what? What are hateful racists hating if human races don't exist and we're all the same, I wonder? This is from an academic master thesis posted online entitled Promoting Intercultural Competence Through J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, whatever that word salad means. You can find a lot of these theses online, and while not the most reliable sources known to man, some of them are quite revealing in regards to what's going on in the academic humanities. As you probably already suspected, it's a lot of self-congratulatory, ivory tower verbal masturbation. It's funny, these academic types and their student disciples rail at the notion of race and write it off as a social construct, but take no offense, for instance, at using the word species. Yet none of them can give you a solid definition of the ever-evolving term species. Most will tell you it denotes life forms that can mate and produce viable offspring. Yet tigers and lions, for instance, different species we are told by zoologists, can reproduce and have offspring that reproduce. Closer to genetic home, there is Neanderthal DNA in our Homo sapiens genome, which clearly indicates we interbred and produce viable offspring together, but scientists can't tell you for sure if we are subspecies, the same species, or a different species altogether. And here's the catch. When we find the answer to this question of how Neanderthals and modern humans are related genetically, it may impact the very definition of the biological term species. Why? Because it's a social construct. Just like race. The phrase social construct is a social construct. And now we see how absurd this pointless argument can get. All the words in every human language are social constructs. So what's the point of emphasizing this fact selectively and at times of political expedience? Removing significance from parts of a language you don't like while accepting its existence in others is completely asinine. We are social animals. There's no intellectual merit in pointing out that we construct interpretations of the world around us in a social manner, other than to demonstrate you're exceptionally proficient at bloviating in an academically approved manner. It's like scoffing at the fact that we breathe, or dismissing a particular shade of blue because, quote, it's just a color, unquote. Yeah, and so are red, green, and yellow. What's your point? Either our representations of the world around us are accurate and true to the best of our imperfect human ability to discover what is in fact true, or they are not. And if race is meaningless, then any terms derived from it, like racist, by definition have to be meaningless as well, and progressives need to stop using it every five seconds. But the fact of the matter is, race and racism are not without their usefulness, depending upon how you apply them, just like any word in any language. Tolkien was indeed a, quote, racist, unquote, in the sense that he recognized human populations in different regions of the globe have experienced different environmental and evolutionary pressures, which have produced significant differences in genetic traits. That is to say, he knew human races existed as evidenced by things like sickle cell developing in African populations due to increased prevalence of malaria in their surroundings, but being absent in European stocks. In 1938, Tolkien was asked by a Berlin publishing house wishing to translate his works into German to prove that he was Aryan. And his reply, as it appears in the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, is dripping with sarcasm and seems to toy with his inquisitors. Now, no one really knows if it was actually sent to the publisher, but it's clear he took exception to the question being posed. In a valedictory address to the University of Oxford in 1959, Tolkien said, I have the hatred of apartheid in my bones. And in a letter to his son, Michael, in 1941, he famously quipped that Adolf Hitler was a, quote, ruddy little ignoramus, unquote. All of this seems to indicate Tolkien was opposed to doctrines or regimes basing themselves on racial identity. And this may or may not have been true, I don't know. Personally, though, I think it only means he did not believe such ideologies or governments justified cruel treatment of races outside their allegiance or charter. Right or wrong, hypocritical or not, in light of ally war crimes like the bombing of Dresden, Tolkien believed, as Churchill did, 
that the Nazis were unnecessarily cruel to their enemies and had to be defeated. Progressives often use these statements and this political stance of Tolkien's, in addition to an excerpt from a 1955 lecture on the English and Welsh in which he labeled race a, quote, much misused, unquote, expression, to imply that Tolkien was coming around to their belief that race was meaningless. He started his career steeped in antiquated early 20th century notions of race and slowly but surely began to grow out of such racist ideals. But nothing in those letters or speeches suggests to me he did not believe in the concept of biological race. Quite the contrary, they seem to indicate that he knew it did indeed exist. Consider his snarky reply to the German publisher. But if I am to understand that you are inquiring whether I am of Jewish origin, I can reply only that I regret that I appear to have no ancestors of that gifted people. This is not a rejection of race, but rather a clear acknowledgement that there are notable genetic differences even among European populations. Tolkien, I think, can safely be interpreted here as talking about European or Ashkenazi Jews. And one can further assume that he was aware of their high average intelligence, verbal IQ, and ability to integrate into societies quickly and generally at the upper levels of their critical institutions, their hierarchies. And he certainly would have been keenly aware of how their intellect would allow them to quickly pick up the language of whatever new region they migrated to. Remember, he was a philologist. I would even go so far as to say Tolkien recognized this as an evolutionary development within these, quote, gifted people, unquote. After all, if you are repeatedly cast out of civilizations, chances are only those among you who possess the ability to reintegrate rapidly and successfully elsewhere will survive to produce future generations. What Tolkien thought of the suspicions that understandably can arise among the Gentiles of a given nation or region who witness these unnatural seeming talents to seamlessly slip back into and succeed within their societies, one can only guess. Acknowledging race as a legitimate scientific concept does not make Tolkien racist in the pejorative progressive sense, because it does not immediately follow that he condoned or promoted hatred of or cruelty toward human populations with different traits from what we all think of as native Europeans. To think otherwise is to make the same mistake with Tolkien that political opponents of the alt-right often make, a preference for or vested interest in racial superiority and all the alleged privileges that come along with it are assumed to drive the thought process, rather than a simple observation of perceived reality or the facts as they see them. If white identitarians truly were, quote, supremacists, unquote, or arguing the case for their race's supremacy, why would they readily admit to the average IQ of whites being below that of East Asians or Ashkenazi Jews? Whether or not you agree with their perception of the world around us and the racial statistics they claim can be derived from it, how often do supremacists settle for third place? Only the worst supremacists ever do such things. The white supremacist label makes as much sense as the racist one does for Tolkien, who merely recognized that genetic advantages and disadvantages among races exist and can't be ignored. There is no preference for or glorification of these differences. It's just a state of being we all have to accept in Tolkien's mind. He was never personally invested in these things being true, he just saw them as true. If Tolkien truly had been trying to produce white male propaganda, as the progressives claim, why did he incorporate several elven kindreds who were clearly superior to white men in myriad ways into his stories? You are welcome to disagree all you want that racial differences or superior and inferior traits exist, for whatever reason it is that you do this, but you can't mischaracterize Tolkien merely acknowledging acknowledging their existence as promotion or celebration of their existence. And it's patently absurd to call recognition supremacy. Am I a limb supremacist for realizing snakes have no arms and legs? So that definition of racist we can indeed discard, at least with respect to Tolkien, because if it had any legs, unlike snakes, scenes like the one where Sam considers the plight of a Southern man with sincere sympathy would not exist. Sam would have regarded him with contempt and disgust or dismissed him as beneath his concern. Concern. He does no such thing, however, so I will consider the book on Tolkien's supposed racism and supremacist hatred closed. If I'm interpreting this scene right, when it comes to race, the only thing Tolkien cares about is that you are not wrenched from your homeland, and he fully recognizes that if you are somewhere you do not belong, then something has gone terribly wrong in the world. Sam does not look at this man as some evil creature or bloodthirsty mindless enemy to be wantonly destroyed. He sees him as a victim of a cruel war into which he has 
has been dragged, likely against his will, or at least his druthers, and with a very good chance of it having happened under threat. Sam is witnessing the fallout of Mortar's desire to institute one ruling order over the entire world, or if you'll excuse the term, its globalist agenda. And by inference, one would have to assume this would be Tolkien's view of slavery in the real world as well. Beyond its obvious cruelty, slavery would be wrong for Tolkien because it snatches someone from his or her normal surroundings and social spheres, and places that individual somewhere alien and hostile. So with the progressive's derogatory view of Tolkien as racist thoroughly dissected and discredited, hopefully, we can move on to more interesting matters such as where he lands regarding the nature versus nurture debate. And we can do so with the understanding that all references to race in the coming discussion strictly disavow undertones of hatred and cruelty commingled in with the popular conception of the term racism. We are only discussing inherent differences between groups of human beings, and nothing about those distinctions implies racial advantages justify malicious treatment of those lacking such superior traits. And I should point out that Tolkien considers elves and dwarves and hobbits to be human beings just like men. The word race appears in the Silmarillion about 20 times. The word gender does not appear at all. No surprise there, since the connotation of male and female, though being around since the 1400s or thereabouts, did not become popular until modern times, and it would have been clumsy and out of place in Silmarillion prose. And Tolkien would have been a fool, not a philologist and a popular author, if he did not choose his words carefully. There are, of course, many mentions of women and children and their implied secondary roles, however. But let's set the issue of gender aside for the moment and get back to what race in Tolkien's fiction can tell us about the clash between genetics and environment. Last episode, I promised that we'd return to the death match between Fingolfin and Morgoth, because it revealed something essential about what side Tolkien was on in that argument. Some of you may already rightly guess where I'm going with this, as I've hinted at it with statements like the first few generations of Noldor being something akin to demigods. Try as they might, elves like Elrond and Glorfindel, and even a legendary king like Gilgalad, all of whom were of later Noldor stock, could not hope to achieve what Fingolfin did. No training or study can help them match his prowess. Gilgalad was killed by Sauron, who is only a Maya, not a Vala like Morgoth, despite having the assistance of Elendil in that combat. Two against one, and although the ring gets cut from Sauron's hand, there's no mention of seven wounds troubling him for the remainder of his existence before banishment to the Void. Elves of later ages cannot be nurtured into warriors on par with their ancestors. Something essential is lost in each subsequent generation of Noldor. The same is true of the Adain, or men. Would Aragorn have been able to slay Glaurung on his own like Turin? Probably not. And Aragorn had elven blood in his veins, unlike Turin, who lived before the mingling of men and elves produced the line of Numenorean men. And one would assume that Thorin Oakenshield, though a grim and commanding dwarven king at times, would bow humbly to the superior might of the original seven fathers of the dwarves, created by Aule, out of impatience and in defiance of Eru. There are only rare instances where descendants outdo ancestors, such as Bilbo outliving the old Took. And the ring is probably to be credited or blamed, depending upon how you look at it, for that longevity. And let's face it, hobbits are just too damn short and fat to factor into this nature versus nurture calculus in any serious way. Except if it's to point out that they just don't have the genetics necessary to establish great kingdoms like Gondor and Rohan. No matter how much they train militarily, the overachievements of the four hobbits who are part of the Fellowship notwithstanding. And there is, of course, no need to consider consider if later generations of men could exceed the deeds of Fingolfin and his elven peers, as was established in the last Hierarchy episode. If the greatest men of Fingolfin's time could not hope to do so, neither could men of the second, third, or fourth ages. In keeping with the ideals of Romanticism, Tolkien sees earlier bloodlines as more genetically robust. The past glory of each race in Tolkien's world simply cannot be reproduced, no matter the environmental conditions. And as strongly as he makes this point in his books, one would have to assume Tolkien leaned toward the mingling of races in the real world, resulting in the loss of something essential that was present in their ancestors' distinct populations. Many Tolkien purists do not consider the Silmarillion canon, because it was compiled, edited, and published posthumously by Christopher Tolkien from his father's notes on the legends of Middle-earth. If the professor himself was still working on such a history, the theory goes, and did not deem it ready or fit to be released for public consumption before he died, then we as readers have 
have no right to assume the book represents a finished mythology or an accurate and reliable set of tales or lore. What if he had lived 10 more years and decided to change something major? Personally, I don't buy into this theory too much, and I only mention the controversy here because there is a lot of debate among Tolkien diehards about the true origins of orcs, which I need to get into. Christopher Tolkien chose to include the idea that they were elves captured by Morgoth and corrupted into an evil race. But apparently he had choices because Tolkien was debating several other possibilities in his draft versions, such as they were corrupted men, or they were a separate race altogether like dwarves or hobbits. I happen to like the notion that they were twisted and tormented elves, though, because it makes Morgoth's evil seem less abstract and more palpable and unsettling. It's one thing to war against elves and kill them in great numbers, or even hunt them down and capture them, but it's a whole other level of disturbing to run what essentially must have been horrific genetic experiments on them in order to warp them into such abnormal beings. And orcs were around and fighting the Noldor well before men showed up in Beleriand. So making the Corrupted Men original story work just seems like a fool's errand to me. Plus, there's the legend that trolls were corrupted Ents, and not only does that jibe quite nicely with the version of Orc Genesis found in the Silmarillion, but hardly anyone makes a peep about their origin story. I guess because there's no, quote, xenophobic, unquote, description of their dark skin or other foreign-seeming features, but I'm regressing back to a topic I promised to move on from. All of this seems fine and dandy, but you're probably wondering what the origin of orcs has to do with the nature versus nurture debate, and frankly, so am I. And I'm not trying to be smart or glib here. I honestly can't figure out how they fit in. On the one hand, the hellish environment of Udun, or Autumno, or Thangorodrim, or Angban, or wherever it was ultimately that Morgoth kept his elven victims, must have contributed to them turning into orcs. But once transformed, no environment or experiment could restore them to their previous uncorrupted state. Or at least you can find no mention of a cure, let's say, for their orcishness in Tolkien's writing. At no point in the tales of Middle-earth do we encounter an orc miraculously recovering and becoming an elf once again. Saruman has to breed his orcs with men to produce spies with the bare minimum collection of genes, social skills, and civility required to mingle with the inhabitants of places like Bree. So clearly, once conditions arise for you to become an orc, there's no escaping your new traits unless they're bred out of you. I mean, we didn't see anything about the orcs that seemed to be in any way redeemable. In what way could we reintegrate orcs into society? Precisely, Sargon. Couldn't have said it better myself. So before I move on to the gender part of the presentation here, I'm going to make that quick detour I promised at the outset and tackle Sargon and Black Pigeon Speaks. Now, of course, I was being a bit tongue-in-cheek. I don't actually think they have heard of me or my minuscule YouTube channel. I'm pretty sure the similarities between our videos are simply bizarre coincidence, especially in light of yet another progressive news outlet recently signal-boosting yet another progressive science fiction author bashing Tolkien for being racist. Chances are pretty good that was the inspiration for their videos, as opposed to this pet little project of mine. Now, I could dissect that Wired Article 2, I suppose, but I think it will be much more interesting to take on these two would-be trespassers. Although I said I would be concentrating on progressive critics, not centrist or right-wing Tolkien enthusiasts, like Sargon and Black Pigeon Speaks, nevertheless, they have dared to enter my spurgy wheelhouse and will suffer for the dire consequences for not kissing the uh, ring, shall we say. And I've already broken one rule I laid out for myself in the introduction regarding episode time limits by making the second installment over 30 minutes long, so I figure screw it, I might as well break yet another and critique non-progressives as well. Okay, let's get into this little diversion. When I got home I dug out my copy of Lord of the Rings from a box somewhere and found that there was worse to come. The Two Towers is a story of the battle between Isengard and Rohan in the good corner of the Riders of Rohan, a.k.a. the White Skins. I'm not sure where they're described as the White Skins anywhere. Uh, not a good start, Sargon. You haven't read the books, have you? Are we honestly at the point where we can't depict an evil race of non-humans in fantasy without us relating them to black people or Muslims? The people who are making the orc memes were mocking you and not 
the Muslims. I find these two statements genuinely confusing. I'd say this is you choosing your words carefully because of the recent Tommy Robinson and Nigel Farage UKIP fiasco, but you uploaded this video well before Farage rage quit your party because Robinson supposedly is filled with anti-Islamic hate or whatever. I'm truly wondering if you'd like to have these two statements back because here's the thing. As I mentioned in the intro to this series, Tolkien was not creating run-of-the-mill fantasy. The Lord of the Rings is a cut above lesser efforts like the Elfstones of Shannara, for instance, because it was intended to be a mythology for English-speaking people. And while we can debate till we're blue in the face whether or not regular fantasy is pure escapism, not worth applying to real-world affairs, mythology is a beast wrapped in an altogether different hide. Tolkien did mean for us to derive valuable life lessons from his prose, so you may want to rethink glibly dismissing Shire Invaders being parallels to what we've seen take place recently in Europe. The progressives are not wrong for making the assumption that Tolkien's invaders can and probably do represent Muslims for many Tolkien fans. They are just misguided idiots for thinking there is something inherently pernicious to that interpretation. And while you are right that lampooning far-left liberals is one of the points of orc posting, it by no means gives Muslims a pass. Again, I'm not really sure I understand why you would have said this. Maybe you just misspoke. I don't know. After all, who do you think will be let into our societies by the open border? policies or posting targets? Who are we being asked to ignore when we're told to carry on as usual after an attack so easily symbolized by what Shire Hobbits go through in the books? If you do happen to watch this video, Sargon, click back to the beginning quote from John Rhys Davies and ask yourself if he has the right of it or you do. And now I've broken another rule of the series, praising something or someone from the movies, though I suppose I already did that by admiring its meme-ready imagery. Back in the spring of 2018, the hashtag orc posting began trending on Twitter and then over on the containment board that is 4chan poll with screenshots from the Lord of the Rings movies complete with captions that ridiculed the buzzwords and doublethink of social justice by depicting orcs of the movie as either social justice warriors themselves or groups of people that they pander to. Who those groups are is up to the beholder of the meme, and I will let you decide that for yourself. At least Black Pigeon Speaks gets that orcs in orc posting can represent Muslims for readers, moviegoers, and meme fans alike. He just seems to be confused about certain Tolkien terminology. I suspect this is because, like Sargon, he has not read the books. I'll try and forgive you two filthy Tolkien casuals, but I doubt my ideal hipster wife here, if I were ever foolish enough to desire one of those, will be able to. Okay, so now that I've probably pissed off two YouTube content providers I admire and want to be just like when I grow up, and irritated anyone in their large fan bases who might stumble across this video, let me point out that you shouldn't take my nitpicking too much to heart. I'm an extreme Tolkien geek, and both videos are highly entertaining and mostly spot on, and you will probably enjoy them if you choose to watch them, which you should. Once you've gotten your fill of superficial lulls, however, just remember to come back to this series for a more in-depth analysis. Speaking of which, no examination of Tolkien and gender can fully omit Eowyn. Now, personally, I don't find Eowyn's character terribly interesting. In fact, I find her rather grating and irritating. If I'm forced to pick a female character from his works that I think is most interesting, it would probably be either Muriel, Feanor's mother, or Adathel, Turgon's sister, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. They do not wear their don't-need-no-stinking-man feminism on their sleeves, and their triggering of a cascade of horrible events is something we've all witnessed actual women set in motion in our own lives. Muriel wishes to give birth to the great child of Iluvatar, and in selfishly achieving those ends, also births pretty much every tragedy that follows in the Silmarillion. Adathel grows bored with the peace and prosperity of Gondolin, and her childlike restlessness and egocentric desire for pointless drama in her life lead to the Hidden Realm's downfall. If we're all being honest, their stories are a more realistic depiction of actual female behavior in the real world than Eowyn's. She, in contrast, seems a forced ploy to placate the feminine 
feminist masses. But whatever, if I want to be more charitable, I can also look at her character in another way, and that is as a realistic depiction of another behavior we've all seen women exhibit in the real world, invading male spaces and screaming, look at me. There is the chance Tolkien was not in fact pandering, but instead knew exactly what he was doing with her character. He was depicting feminist cancer and female attention whoring in an honest way and not pulling any punches. After forcing her way into the male warrior world of Rohan, she even takes an early retirement to have kids. This too rings true with what women often do these days. Eowyn follows this short-sighted feminine conduct arc to a T, so who am I to judge Tolkien's intentions here as anything but an honest wish to accurately depict the human female? But as far as gender relates to the nature versus nurture debate, it's my opinion that no female character in Tolkien's world has more to tell us than Feanor's mother, Muriel. And like with the origin story of orcs, the connection may not be quite clear at first. The love of Finwë and Muriel was great and glad, for it began in the blessed realm in the days of bliss. But in the bearing of her son, Muriel was consumed in spirit and body, and after his birth she yearned for release from the labour of living. And when she had named him, she said to Finwë, Never again shall I bear child, for strength that would have nourished the life of many has gone forth into Feanor. Now, you may be inclined to think that passage implies nothing beyond Muriel being a victim of childbirth circumstances beyond her control. Perhaps Eru meant for Feanor to be the greatest of the children of Iluvatar and imbued him with such powerful spirit that Muriel could not survive bringing him to term. However, this notion can be put to rest if you read Of the Laws and Customs Among the Eldar from Morgoth's Ring. And here is the critical bit. It is said that Muriel answered Mondos saying, I came hither to escape from the body, and I do not desire ever to return to it. My life is gone out into Feanaro, my son. This gift I have given to him whom I loved, and I can give no more. Beyond Arda, this may be healed, but not within it. All right, it would sound much cooler if Martin Shaw read it. Anyway, clearly Muriel chose to do this to herself, and no one else is to blame, especially not God. Take a moment to really consider just what it is Tolkien is doing by having Muriel opt for this course of action. I could be making more of it than I should, but I think I think it's pretty damn fascinating. Tolkien is essentially glorifying death in childbirth. He has a woman who believes it is her duty to forfeit her own life force in order for her child to become all but superhuman. Why the hell does she feel the need? Because remember, the early generations of Noldor were already going to be borderline demigods anyway, even without their mothers sacrificing themselves to amplify their spirit. Finway's second wife did no such thing for Fingolfin, and he matured into someone who could challenge more Morgoth in single combat. Now consider for a moment your average feminist in the real world, fighting for abortion rights at a time when modern medicine has drastically reduced the risk of death in childbirth. She sees the unborn child as the one who must sacrifice for the mother, not the other way around. What Muriel did is an absurdity, if not an outrage to her. Is there any wonder why feminists hated Tolkien so much? Maybe Muriel is nothing more than Arda's first tiger mom gone wrong. She wants her child to succeed, so she pushes herself way too hard to make it happen and dies as a consequence. But Feanor's greatness is not a product of accumulated knowledge and acquired skills bestowed upon him by a smothering parent. It is his spirit, first and foremost, which makes him so potent. It is therefore something innate. And had Muriel decided instead to birth a normal elven child, whatever that means, and stick around to be part of his life, she would not have been able to tutor or nurture him into the greatest elf to ever live. By having her choose to sacrifice herself, Tolkien is telling us a mother is simply incapable of crafting such an environment, with her son at least. Perhaps with great effort, Finwë could have trained Feanor to be exceptional beyond reach of his peers, but if his mother wishes to do so, she must give up something essential to her very being. And this indomitable spirit she transfers to him is not something a daughter would require or could receive. Even Galadriel's mother doing this for her would seem absurd. Nor is it something a father could have granted given his limited influence and connection while the child is still in utero. Finway dying in the effort to imbue Feanor with his essence would be a storytelling reach 
not a moving and tragic outcome to which we can all relate. This fatal maternal gesture of Muriel's is symbolic of what Tolkien, a Catholic traditionalist, believed only a mother could provide after abandoning most or all self-interest and self-preservation instincts at the critical early stages of her son's life. It is the ultimate offering that only the female gender can make for her male offspring. Once again, there should be little confusion as to why the professor rubbed feminists the wrong way, to put it mildly. Okay, I think I've made the case using specific examples of race and gender from his stories that nurture takes a backseat to nature in Tolkien's universe and in his moral principles. And this preeminence of genetics, or what is innate in the individual and his or her race or gender, once again firmly places his mythology and its themes at odds with the progressive worldview. Before I bring this video to a close, I want to engage in another somewhat self-indulgent diversion. Don't worry, we won't be discussing a young Planet Evans' reading habits. I don't know how true it is, but there's this idea out there floated by casual critics and academics alike that the Dunlendings, or wild men, are intended to represent the Welsh. Again, I don't know how reliable this theory is, but apparently back in the day, the English considered the Welsh somewhat swarthy and primitive, despite their genetics, one would assume, being about as close as two separate human populations can be. There isn't much distance and there aren't too many geological barriers between Wales and England, so one would assume there was a lot of gene swapping going on over the centuries. If you look at a Welshman like John Rhys Davies, however, you can maybe see why the English thought this way about the Welsh. He does look a little swarthy and primitive. Film directors probably wouldn't have had him play Arabs and dwarves if he didn't. Don't shoot the messenger people, I had absolutely nothing to do with the casting of his films. The thing is, like a lot of Americans, I'm a Euro mutt. Now I've never done a true ancestry search to verify, but older family members inform me that I'm part Welsh. But unlike Davies, my features are about as Aryan as they come. This could be because I'm told I also have German and French blood as well. So being Welsh, German, and French, I obviously keep my sheep in a concentration camp and retreat when they escape. If it's true that the wild men were indeed intended to represent one of my nationalities, you'd think this devotion to drawing very exact and particular racial or genetic lines on Tolkien's part would get me all ass-blasted and offended like touchy progressives. Why the hell would he bother to distinguish between Englishmen and Welshmen and make the differences so stark? But actually I totally understand. The Welsh have their own traditions and language, one with way too many consonants for me to have ever bothered learning it. And getting back to the point I made in the intro, Tolkien was trying to make a mythology for the English language, and that means for English people, which does not necessarily include the Welsh. Language is inextricably tied to culture and its development in Tolkien's mind, remember? The Welsh with their own screwed up language and culture can make their own mythology. The point of this seemingly tangential closing rant is to reinforce the notion that insisting human populations have their place in the world and their superior and inferior traits should not chap your ass. After all, the wild men fight against the Rohirrim and Gondor just like orcs. So if I, as someone of Welsh descent, don't get all triggered by the Welsh being portrayed as invaders or enemies, no one should get their panties in a bunch over what ethnicities or races Sauron's other allies may or may not represent. All right, everybody, that's episode three in the bag. Thanks for tuning in once again, and I'll see you for part four, Good versus Evil. <laughs>